Hey everybody, welcome to the Blender Report, where news meets rational thinking. I'm your host, Jonathan Harvey, and this is your co-host, Liam DeBoer. Liam, what's up, dude? Not too much, brother. Today, we're going to be chatting about Trudeau's imaginary hate militia, the union leaders pledging support for anti-Israel encampments, advocating quote-unquote consequences for dissenters, the 2024 World Press Freedom Index finding that truth is under fire, more Canadians are leaving the country due to poor affordability and the lack of opportunity, the public inquiry on foreign interference finding that China was the problem, as well as the U.S. passing a controversial law expanding definition and punishment for anti-Semitism. However, before we get into things, if you wouldn't mind leaving us a kind review on Spotify or subscribing to our YouTube channel wherever you are watching, that would be greatly appreciated. All right, let's get started. So first off, we've got Trudeau's imaginary hate militia. In the past week, the Liberal Party has strongly accused the Conservatives of being connected to a secretive white nationalist group called Diagalon. During question period on Tuesday, Trudeau responded to every question from Conservative leader Pierre Polyev with allegations that the opposition was associated with white supremacists. However, the evidence supporting these claims is weak, to say the least. Investigations by police and security services into Diagalon Diagalon have revealed that it is a small, disorganized group of right-leaning individuals on the internet. In addition, Diagalon's ties to the Conservative Party are limited to an incredibly brief moment in 2022, when Diagalon leader Jeremy McKenzie shook Polyev's hand at a fundraiser. Despite police findings that Diagalon is not an extremist threat, lacks ties to the Conservatives, and is essentially a joke, Trudeau and the Liberals continue pushing this narrative. So so how can we trust a government that can't tell the difference between a violent white nationalist militia and what amounts to essentially a meme designed to troll the government with hate speech laws? Well, the reality here is that they knew they knew what these, this group was, right? If you and I know and the rest of social media knows and the rest of Canada, if they're paying any attention, they know exactly what this is. But they just weaponized it, right? We're living in this something that I kind of call like the popularity contest era of federal politics. Now, this is where a time where policy takes back seat. You and I have talked about this. And and policy will will be important, but not until about six months out from the election, right? So until then, um, the goal is to win points with the people by being more likable, being more charming, or using today's political weapon of choice, which is bashing the opposition, right? So obviously, if you look at what's happening so far, Polyev has been slaying Trudeau and the liberals. And this is happening for a few reasons. First, he's always well prepared. The guy's always, always sharp. You know what I mean? He always knows what he's saying. Um, whether it's scripted or not, he's just 100% on point. Um, second, he obviously has a solid team behind him because the way that he's spinning these ideas in a marketable, marketable tactics is actually quite impressive as someone who has like, I, I've, I've got a marketing background, a marketing business. And the way that they're doing like it is really, it's quite masterful to be honest with you. Whether you like it or not, it's really impressive. And third, I mean, Trudeau is absolutely shooting the bed, right? So, I mean, putting him down is like shooting fish in a barrel. Yeah, look, that being said, like it's it's not shocking that the liberals are targeting Polyev with these unfounded accusations because they really don't have any other ammo. But perhaps more significantly, um, they completely control the mainstream media. So anybody who relies sort of on legacy news, they will accept these claims as true. And I know that they're sort of banking on that. You know what I mean? It, it's the same as kind of like the Trump-Russia collusion, right? Like that turned out to be false. But if you ask anyone, like even my parents love them to death, but they're, they're diehard liberals uh, and they see the light from time to time. But if you ask them about Trump and Russia, they will say, oh, no, yeah, no, he was colluding with Russia. It's like, well, that was proven to be false. But it's kind of similar to like the Me Too movement, too, right? Like, sure, men are pigs. But a lot of the people that were accused of those things didn't do anything, but it didn't matter. As soon as you were wearing that stain, it was already too late. The truth didn't really matter, right? So once, once it's out there, the damage is done. So I, it's my opinion that they know this is bullshit. Uh, unfortunately, in today's landscape of sort of sound bites and social echo chambers, um, it's clear that if you don't play the game this way, you will lose. So I'm of the mind they're just doing what they need to do. I think there is something to be said about Diagalon, and to be honest, I think probably a lot of the guys that are involved in that, I don't know them deeply. I, I've come across a few of the the kind of, I guess leaders again it's not really a group it's like an online meme that these guys started yeah. as a way to troll it's not a formal group it's made, it's made up bullshit yeah the guy said it's it's just a made up it's they said it was a country and they had a flag with a diagonal line yeah that's enough <laughs> that being said the people that are behind that they are 
they are whack bags. They are they are losers for sure. Um, I don't deny that. Yes, I don't deny that. I don't I don't know any of them, but looking at some of the things they're saying and what they're doing, um, yeah, for sure, for sure. But, but what's what's crazy is that even uh, Polyev got the RCMP to launch an investigation on these guys because on a podcast they were claiming I haven't listened to it myself so who knows whether it was said in a joking manner or whether it was said in a threatening manner yeah was but it they satire did satire or a complete farce I don't know well yeah but they were making comments about uh R how do I say this without getting censored? R A P I N G ing Polyev's wife. Oh, that's fucked. Yeah, and then so Polyev I got that. so Polyev yeah, got yeah, them yeah, to yeah, launch yeah. an investigation, and right. he very much said, "Screw all these guys. This yeah. is this is dumb." And then wow. the liberals still come after him, saying, "Oh, he's a supporter of them. He rubs arms with them." It's like, no, this group of guys, these dudes, they have actually actively tried to because as pointed out they were their supporters of the ppc and they've actually tried to sabotage polyev and that's what they on a podcast before they had that handshaking moment with polyev jeremy yeah. mckenzie the the quote-unquote leader yeah before he went to one of his rallies and shook hands and took a picture with polyev he was even talking about how he knew that that would bring bad press for Polyev and that was kind of like they were trying to sabotage him right so these these groups with Polyev are Polyev very clearly does not like them and they clearly don't like Polyev but yet right. the Trudeau <clears throat> liberals continue to try to make it seem like Polyev is trying to court their vote court the alt-right vote it's just it's utter lunacy and and so yeah I don't trust a government that is currently trying to enact hate speech laws and put people in prison for things like say white supremacist ideals or hateful or, or hateful speech or all of this kind of stuff and very clearly having no objective basis in when they levy those charges against people no you know you know what's actually kind of funny it reminded me of something that just came up the other day in the news uh it's science but it's, it's a little off topic but northwestern university researchers use statistical physics to confirm fritz Heid, fritz Heider's social balance theory confirming the axiom that the enemy of my enemy is in fact your friend right so it's just kind of funny like yeah. scientifically proven i know it's kind of jokes but it's like yeah it's funny like they identified even the even the egregious things that those guys did i forgot about that that's pretty horrifying yeah you know what i mean that's actually worse than a bad joke that guy deserves a slap in the mouth for that because mm -hmm. that, that that's pretty terrible if someone said that about my wife you have trouble stopping me so i mean i, I kind of understand but yeah obviously the liberals just use them to they weaponize them again but i think we, we said that to begin with right like they know that they're not an alt-right group that it's coordinated in any way whatsoever, right? It's a group of idiot misfits online that are acting like assholes. But the thing is, it's it's the same as kind of this Alex Jones thing, which you and I, it was funny. Like, you and I, I think, sent each other that thing on, on Instagram or, or text or something, saying like, oh, Alex Jones endorsing P P like Paul Yeva, like, that's going to hurt him. That's yeah. going to be a problem. And then they've tried to drag him through the mud with this. They're like, oh, Pierre Paul Yeva won't denounce Alex Jones. It's like, guys, come on, get, get, give me something else. But again, it proves that they've got nothing else to offer because if they had anything with any meat on that bone, that's what they would be using, right? All right, so moving on to our second story of the day, we have got union leaders pledging support for anti-Israel encampments advocating quote-unquote consequences for dissenters. The University of Toronto, like many universities in Canada and the United States, is dealing with anti-Israel protests and encampments on its campus. In response, U of T administrators notified activists that any demonstrations on private school property after 10 p.m. could result in legal consequences. However, this warning prompted union leaders to issue statements expressing solidarity with the protesters. The Canadian Union of Public Employees, otherwise known as CUP, said, quote, we reject fully the administration's attempt to deny them their constitutional right to peaceful assembly, the union wrote in a public statement. The administration says they're protesting on private property, a claim we reject entirely. They are protesting on stolen land. Ontario Public Service Employees Union also shot back. So Kevin Bryan, a business professor at the University of 
Toronto went undercover into the protests on campus and reported his observations from the encampment. Brian noted that many activists were, in fact, not students or affiliated with the university and that they expressed strict ideological conformity to the cause. Brian's social media posts highlighting the presence of non-students in the anti-Israel encampment drew a harsh response from Vic Wojciechowska, I think. I tried. I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> a communications officer at the Ontario Public Service Employees Union. They threatened the U of T professor, suggesting that he should be met with quote unquote street based consequences for infiltrating the protest. So last week I highlighted how I thought these protests could grow, become out of hand, and maybe even become violent. At the time, you thought I was out of pocket and that these protests would fizzle out, but do you still think that's the case? So a couple of things have happened since then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for starters, obviously, the, the, the campus encampments, uh, they spread. I would, I would be willing to bet there's probably 20 plus campuses right now that have encampments on them, and they're throughout Europe, Canada, United States. So that's one thing. So it definitely spread. Um, the second thing is support from these unions, right? And they're large unions, like you said. So until now, um, it's been students and protesters, because we know a lot of them weren't, weren't uh, students, against the institution, right? Um, but now it's protesters with support of institutions against the institutions. So it's a little too early to tell, but this could be the catalyst that propels these protests into the stratosphere. It could. Also, because school is over, they may shift into public property. So uh, if that happens, it, they're going to consolidate and become significantly bigger as well. However, these unions may be also told to shut the fuck up or lose your job. You know, that, that very well may happen. So um, at which point these things will probably fizzle out in the next week or so. In other words, I'm not really convinced either way yet. One thing to note, though, is this development could cause a critical fracture within the Liberal Party and its supporters, and not necessarily due to their stance on Israel, uh, but because they would have to be responsible for addressing the protests eventually, if they do get out of hand, right? Uh, all that said, at the end of the day, I support the right to protest, regardless of my opinion on the matter. I really do, so. Yeah, so here's my thing with the, the protest, because... So I made some videos about the pro-Palestine encampments and was talking about, yes, how I don't think that these people are pro-Palestine as much as they are anti-West and that they are using this as a mechanism to hide behind in order to undermine and try to take over our own social institutions. And, and that comes largely from, in that video, I show from about four or five different protests about uh, openly Marxist uh, openly Marxist protesters, the organizers of these protests, even themselves, saying that this is part of a larger international agenda. So it is very much more than just the Palestine issue. They see it as a as a essentially an impetus that could cause a much larger revolution. The other thing to note with these protests as well is uh, all across, so in the, you have a right to protest, but your rights do not supersede another's. And so they block off these areas in the campus and at the front gates, they have a banner that hangs across the entrance held by students that says from the river to the sea. And then those students grill people as to whether they can come in and take a look around the encampments or not. So they very much set up like quote unquote borders around their campus, which is funny coming from the crowd that very often says that borders themselves are uh, are immoral and that we should have open border societies. So f first of all, their, their right to protest does not give them the right to choose who can and can't be on cer certain areas on campus. And also the liberty side of the conversation, I know it's more conservatives today, but it would have been liberals in the 1970s and so on. We do ourselves a great disservice by not acknowledging the fact that the freedom of speech and freedom of protest and expression and so, these kind of things only apply to government actions. So a university that is private property, it's not public grounds, they don't have to allow you to protest. Now, a lot of universities realize that students are always idealistic. So for their own measures, they will say things like we allow you guys to protest. But usually within that, there's a stipulation that first they cannot 
not uh, wreck private property, which they They're have done doing. all across many campuses, especially uh, I think Columbia has been the worst where they actually took control violently, breaking windows, all of this kind of stuff of one of the main campus halls and then took over the hall and broke people uh, and kept uh, authority figures out of it. And then also they are not allowed to disrupt typical university practices. So one thing that has already started occurring around these protests as well is they've they went into graduation speeches on some of them and mm. started protesting and shutting down the graduation ceremonies. Yeah. Columbia actually just announced that it wouldn't be doing its graduation ceremonies because of these protests. So very much the, this is now surpassed what these universities have even entailed as what they will allow for protests. And again, it goes to that idea where there is restrictions on freedom of protest is just that you, the government can't be the one to crack down on protests on public land. So long as they're not violent. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to your point, like I said, I, I sort of support, I very much support the right to protest, but there is a certain aspect of that when it becomes violent or if it's, you know, I, you know what, I can't even really get into ulterior motives. That's not my business either. I don't really care. Um, but when you're kind of using the tools, you're, you're, the things you're protesting against, you know, like what's happening in, in Israel with, with Hamas and Gaza and everything, but they're, they're doing the same thing on their own campus where they're basically, like you said, you can't come in unless you, you think the same way we do. This guy, uh, Wojciechowska, um, you know, obviously was, was notably a part of Antifa, which, which that 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 right there shows you that the incentive goes much deeper than just what's happening in the Middle East, obviously. But he want they want to crush dissenters. They want they want to bring violence to people that dissent. That's very much the same thing. You know what I mean? It's this problem we have in society, right? Where we are really good at identifying problems, but instead of actually solving the problem, what we do is we like to balance the scales. How we do that is we do something equally egregious on the other side to balance the scales. Look, I'm not calling for cops to come shut this down and whatever. I just want my only interest on my side is just for people to have an accurate accurate view of these protests because they are not your typical protests even the nypd was down talking about how they were they saw the pamphlets that were going around in these protests and it was telling people to cover their face when they're in the encampments what to do if they are arrested who will who to reach out to if they need bail all of these sorts of things so they were very like this is not just your typical grassroots okay everybody come around a, a around a common cause it is very much even politico uh just just put out an article talking about how the rockefeller organizations the soros foundations and all of this kind of stuff are contributing large sums of money to uh these organizations and protests and you actually look back at the same thing again i mentioned how these are i think these could go very similar to the blm protests of 2020 those were the same people behind those uh, protests and organizations that were heavily funding it as well. So again, I'm not calling for, for, for severe crackdowns or anything like this, but I'm just saying that these people have very much, it's, it's the same idea of the using it's it, we see it with the transgender stuff using this language of rights and human rights as a way to actually supersede themselves as more important than everyone else and so their freedom to protest does not my main point here is that their freedom to protest does not eclipse other people's freedom of speech and mobility as well if they want to go somewhere these people don't have any legal or right to stop them they don't have the right to close these areas off and essentially enforce uh enforce borders yeah i think one of the things that i've sort of identified in even just looking at feedback from our audience is that sometimes people get so caught up in an issue that they don't break things down the way you did they don't look at it as its own piece of the puzzle and kind of go okay look what's happening here all they do is they go oh it supports my idea my it supports my cause so i'm going to blindly follow it and everything about that is okay and you're wrong if you disagree it's like hey look there's nuances to all of these things and there's always ulterior motives if you think about it these protests have blown up in the last couple of weeks right but if you look at what's happening in the conflict over in the middle east it's it's horrifying what's happening but it hasn't escalated by any means in fact the volume of killing has obviously slowed down again there's famine there's a lot of i'm not i'm not 
by any means justifying anything that's happening there. But if you look at how the protests have scaled up versus how the violence has scaled up over there, the correlation is way off. Which it's, So it's interesting to see how this just now sort of spiked up. My only thought there would be, when you see something like that, rather than just blindly following it and saying, yes, that's the right thing because I believe in this cause, try to identify why it's happening now and who is involved. Like you said, Soros is involved. Rockefellers are involved. You're looking at these people that have been involved in a lot of terrible, evil things over time, and they've manipulated these and started these culture wars. So when you kind of see this happening, you know what I mean? I, I, think, I think it's worth asking a few questions before you just blindly jump on that bandwagon and then attack anybody else who questions it. Because yeah. that's also not the right thing to do. I think the benefit you and I have, I think the benefit that you and I have in a lot of cases is that we do actually try to remain objective about every step of the way. And I know we're not always objective. I understand that. But we do our best to stay sort of neutral on everything and understand each step as opposed to just saying, well, that fits my narrative. So here's my confirmation bias. I'm buying into that. And I think that's part of what is giving this more air, actually. Yeah. And and again, I think even if you even if you are extremely concerned as what's happening in that conflict, then you should be the first person to be offended by powerful people in our societies using your movement, using your the causes that you care about in order to undermine the Western world and cause chaos and disruption here. And this goes to that idea of well, even what I was just saying in in regards to Diagonalon is you need to be able to call out the bad actors in your on your side. And that's what I loved the most about the freedom protests is because people will like the freedom convoy because people will alike in that and say, well, you supported the freedom convoy. A large reason why I supported that was because, OK, when that guy pissed on the memoriam for the veterans after that all the protesters took day to day to go clean that that uh that statue yeah. day to day when the um when the protesters when when that confederate flag went into the freedom convoy everyone around it started going hey no you're not welcome here get out and they essentially kicked out the confederate flag person and now we can talk about whether that was a plant or not but it was it was very Seems much rather plant it was very much like those protests didn't take they wouldn't allow for any bad actors to come in and try to use their movement for their own purposes. And what we see in these Palestine movements is even if you go look at the, the U of T uh, encampments, all around them are signs like, so for instance, the banner on the front of the encampment is from the river to the sea. Again, something we broke down last episode is, as to how that is a actual genocidal slogan. They also said, we are the intifada, or this is the intifada, is a big sign that's on the side of the uh, the walls for this. It, I also found it funny that they spelled intifada wrong on the sign, but... Uh, no regrets. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> But uh, to put that to to let people know why that's important is that the Intifada was uh, Palestinian uprisings, and the first one was a little bit peaceful. That did actually end up causing a little bit of chaos. But the second and more recent Intifada that happened between Palestine and Israel was from 2000 to 2005, and it was like killings, lots of it, suicide bombings. I think the there was 3,000 Palestinians killed, 1,500 Israelis, and it was just like indiscriminate war, essentially. It was it was guerrilla warfare and, and ter terrorism. And so when you see these people saying things like, this is the intifada, you need to realize what they're actually pointing to, which is violent violent revolution uh, so what i think you could say about the protests if you wanted to sort of compare the two is that the freedom convoy those people were leading by example here's what i want and i'm going to behave as such and then you look at the people that are that are sort of protesting for this palestinian cause and it's very much back to the balancing the scales thing egregious acts happened so we're going to do egregious things and they're doing it from this sort of moral high ground so i think i think that's sort of the big difference but yeah to sort of close it out i, I again to, to your point it's like you can have a you can have a cause whatever that may be and that's great and you can have support for your cause i think that's important but you should be able to highlight and call out those people that are actually working against your cause that are inside of it because it is actually going to work against what you're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. so it's just, i think it's just being able to sort of see that and highlight it when it happens but it, it, it's difficult that takes 
a lot of awareness. It takes self-awareness. It takes a deep understanding of the cause. And it takes, you know, you having to take your own blinders off and then really look for your own confirmation bias before you sort of buy into these things. So I can see why it happens. It is challenging to sort of call it out, but that's why maybe having these conversations is helpful because people will then go and challenge their ideas and the things that, that are happening in, in supporting whatever their cause may be. That is the, the ideal for sure, is that people could have that awareness. I just, again, when you realize that I think their real goal of, of these protesters and their organizers is just to destabilize the Western world more than it is to actually do anything for Palestine, and this just becomes a catalyst that they can use, then it kind of makes sense why they don't call those things out, because those things are part of their interest, which is causing chaos and disruption here. All right, and then moving on to our next story for the day, we've got the U.S. passing controversial law expanding definition and punishment for anti-Semitism. The U.S. House of Representatives passed a bill expanding the definition and punishments for anti-Semitism amid ongoing protests against Israel's actions on ca college campuses. This bill incorporates a definition by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance into federal law, which will affect funding for campuses seen as tolerating anti-Semitism. Supporters are argue it's necessary to combat discrimination, but critics contend there are already existing laws to protect against anti-Semitism and that this will suppress legitimate criticism of Israel, especially regarding its conflict with Gaza. Concerns have been raised that the definition is too broad and would infringe on free speech rights. So is this America's attempt to put forward similar legislation to hate speech bills like we've seen in Scotland, the UK, the EU, Canada, and so on? I actually think it's more a symptom of powerful Jewish leaders in the American community, whether in politics or the corporate world, uh, sort of pulling their weight. That's what I think. Uh, you know, it's interesting. In the bill, it actually states that you can't perpetuate the myth that Jewish people run the media and influence politics. <laughs> That's serious. But the truth is, the American lobbying group advocating for pro-Israeli policies, or APAC, um, is considered, and I quote, the single most influential group in big money democratic electoral politics. And they have contributed funds to 93 out of 100 senators in the United States. So it's a little bit preposterous that you can't perpetuate the truth. Um, not to mention, Jewish people do run and own most of the big media companies in America, including Meta, Disney, which owns everything, Comcast, Google, New York Times, Warner Bros., CNN, and Paramount Pictures. There are more. So let's be honest. There's really nothing wrong with Jewish people owning all these things. That's not an issue whatsoever. Um, but let's not pass a law saying that it's illegal to spread these myths. I think that's a little bit preposterous. All that being said, there is, either, there is a clause in the bill that states that it's not allowed to infringe on your Second Amendment right to free speech. So it's basically an empty threat made to uh, appease the legitimate uh, Jewish stronghold in corporate America and American politics. I think this is just going to make the problem worse. I do agree that there is the, the anti-Semitism on both sides, both on the left and right side of the aisle is bubbling over and it, it's getting pretty crazy and, and kind of disturbing from what I see online sometimes. But you start putting things like this in place, it's going to start having the opposite effect. 100%. You're only going to make people more and more upset about it. Okay, so now this this group... Again, I, I was just saying to you before we, we started this podcast how... You know, when it comes to the, the LGBTQ stuff and all of this, it was like, I was on board for a while, not like widespread, but it was like, okay, yeah, I'll stop saying something is gay or whatever. And then you, you start enforcing it. You start telling me you're going to put me in jail if I say these things, or you're going to give me fines. That's gay. And <laughs> I'm going to say it yeah. just to spite you at this point, yeah. because you do not get to decide what I say. And this is the exact same thing for me when it comes to this, where if you all of a sudden tell me that I can't say that, uh, there's, you know, an overwhelming majority of the media companies owned by Jewish people, then I all of a sudden now want to say it. But the, 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 the way to combat that is with better speech. Now, so when it comes to these things is why, why Jews are overrepresented in certain sectors is because all throughout history, the Jewish population has very much been prosecuted, kicked out of places where they live. So, the Jewish community took up certain professions that would allow them to migrate if they had to. Part of the reason that they get the uh, the label of, say, being cheap or hoarding, like, 
gold or all of this kind of stuff was because if they were to get kicked out of a country, they wanted liquid wealth that they could take with them to another one. And that's the same thing with, say, law or media and all these kind of things was they kind of function. But if you can't be a farmer, because if you get kicked out of being a farmer, then in, you lose all of your land, you can't just pick that right up again in another country. And so there are certain like historical factors and cultural factors that lead to these overrepresentations in certain areas. I mean, we even see too, like Indians are way overrepresented in STEM fields. Like certain cultures do go to certain things for certain reasons. For sure. And so when, if you want to combat these narratives that they don't like about say Jewish people being in certain, certain positions of power, then your the the way that you fight back against that isn't to try to threaten people for pointing it out, but to say like, hey, there's a reason for it, and this is why. Absolutely, yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, educating people, um, explaining the situation would go much further than just making it illegal to talk bad about people, which is wild. I mean, that that to me is a dangerous game. That that you know, to your point about the question, you know, are we getting into this hate speech arena? Even though this one's, this one's, they passed it as a law, but said it can't affect your Second Amendment rights. So really, it's nonsense, right? But, but it is getting closer to that, right? Where, where they are trying to make things illegal, like you, you can't be a Holocaust denier vocally in Canada. I'm not, but you can't be. That's illegal. And now there was this thing about they were they were going on about adding in uh, residential schools. That was next. You can't you can't deny anything about them or talk bad because it harms the people that are still around today. Hey, get fucked. That's how I feel about it. I don't care about your fucking feelings. That's not a real thing. This is what happens to stick, sticks and stones. You know what I mean? So things like this do inch us closer to a world where compelled speech is becoming very real. And we do need to push back against that. We can't allow this to continue moving because it's that thing. It's like if you give them an inch, they take a mile. You give them that thread, they'll knit a sweater. So if we accept this, it only gets worse. Yeah, and too, when you silence people, when you when you drive them out of the public square, all that does is create essentially like speak easies for for these ideas to speak easy. Yeah, and and because and then it only gets worse because then they're not being confronted by anything. They're in their own little so dangerous uh, yeah. echo chamber. So dangerous, and it's not even just like a typical echo chamber like we see on say Instagram. Like the algorithm will just f feed you what you like. It's like no, these will be underground chat rooms and stuff where it's just completely filled with say people that don't like Jews or that want whether it be yeah. white supremacy or whether it be Antifa. You let hate propagate when you stick people in echo chambers. The way that you move things forward is by having conversation. Mm -hmm. So anything you're doing to, to, to break that idea apart, well, then all I believe is that you're only trying to divide people. Yeah. And that's it. And then you look at the political system, you go, oh, conquer and divide. Cool. Got it. Yeah. And like, I mean, I want to know if somebody, if somebody has wild ideas, I want to hear them so I can know who that person is. If all of a sudden we create a culture and ident or like a uh, a process where people can't speak their mind, then I don't know who I'm dealing with. That's all of true. a sudden, it's a lot of people. Like I'm like, okay, what does this person think? But I I would much rather be like that person's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's actually kind of frustrating when you, you you look at kind of how things have changed from when our parents were young, right? And it's like you'd be sitting at a table with a bunch of people. You could have Republicans, Democrats, you could have Libertarians, you could have Independents, you could have literally everybody at the table. They'd all be there getting along, having fun. They'd have conversations about things, and then they'd move on with it. They wouldn't care. But now we've gotten to this point where it's like, you don't even let them in the same room, yeah. let alone sitting at your table. What's wrong with you? They're the enemy. It has gotten so far out of hand. This kind of shit's only going to make it worse. And I don't know how we get back to normal. You know, I think that's a big reason why a lot of people want to get the hell out of this country. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a reason why a lot of people are like, there's, there's just no sense of community. Everything's broken. Like you and I are considered, if people if people don't know us, they hear our stuff or that we get categorized in this far right category. That's not at all who we are. But then, but that's a label in society now that people are afraid to wear. It's like, it's it's basically, you basically get ostracized. It's the, it's the community dunce cap. Like I get fucked. But you know what I mean? Like, that, that's that's where the world is at these days. And we need to find a way to get back to a point where we can find commonality with our fellow man, human, um, so we can have relationships. Because I think that's probably one of the most significant parts of being a human is having great relationships with people. And we're allowing this, this political divide to separate us and create massive, massive division. And not only division, but like hate. It's really, really a dark time in history because of this. And these kinds of things... Uh, they just they just make things worse. It's such a shame. 
we all have the potentiality for evil and understanding that and overcoming it is the only true way forward. It was that Alexander Solzhenitsyn quote that I love from uh, the Gulag Archipelago where he was saying, the line of human evil is not one that gets drawn between epochs, nations, or races, but rather between every individual human heart. And it's like, that's that's what we, we, need, to, we need to realize that. So that's where we solve that is, is not trying to impose speech restrictions on people not trying to impose that people think a certain way it's that us every single one of us as individuals has to come and actually overcome that othering but all right moving on to the next story for the day we've got the 2024 world press freedom index finding that truth is under fire so the annual world press freedom index by reporters without borders reveals a troubling trend of intensified political attacks on press freedom around the world the index assesses journalists ability to work freely and independently across 180 countries according to the report press freedom is facing a sharp decline worldwide due to political pressures disinformation information, suppression on independent media, and the detainment of journalists. As more than half of the global population heads to the polls in 2024, the RSF notes that governments are failing to protect journalism. The overall trend indicates a global crisis in press freedom, highlighting the critical need to protect journalists and the freedom of information they represent. So who is the biggest threat to journalists and how do we turn this one around? Well, it's funny, right? Because there's a reasonable amount of crossover between between us and mainstream journalists in that we all think that governments are the problem. Um, where we differ is in identifying which governments and why. You know what I mean? The reality though is governments are really the only problem, right? That's the only thing that's stifling journalism is people getting in their way, which are governments. And whether it's a rebel group or not, but in general, it's whoever the governing body is, they're the problem, right? Whether they're jailing journalists in Russia, killing them in the Middle East, making them disappear in China, which actually has the highest jailing journalist rate, um, ostracizing them for dissenting opinions in Canada or the United States, funding the media so that they're state controlled, once again, Canada, or implementing policy that restricts outlets like social media companies from allowing independent journalism. In fact, the index actually suggested Canada's biggest media challenge was that they don't get enough funding from the government, almost as if nationalizing was a solution. It is funny that throughout there it says, you know, our governments are failing to protect journalism. It's like governments are the threat to journalism. So it's really an action. It's more about them not doing things to journalists than it is about getting them to do things for journalists. Because, yeah, again, like we've seen within Canada, you just have if if places like the CBC, you know, one point four billion dollars a year in federal funding, they would if those checks start coming in, that media outlet is going to close within the month. And so they don't have any, and I mean, we see the same thing down in the States when it comes to pharmaceutical advertisers, 75% of uh, advertising on the media down in the States is from pharmaceutical companies, right? So again, now you have a master. Now, now you have a vested interest in keeping that person happy. The person that's keeping the lights on, it's not my job to keep happy. And so, yeah, the idea that funding more of them would, would lead to freer press, that's just laughable. But then we also saw... A recent ledger poll which uncovered a uh, concerning tr trend among Canadians regarding the state of freedom of speech in the country. So obviously this comes a little bit out of journalism, but journalism is a major part of freedom of speech. And the poll indicated that 57% of Canadians believe that freedom of speech is under threat in Canada, while only 36% feel it is not. And uh, one of the most biggest examples of that that people responded to was the online harm act right these these hate speech bills which could get you a seventy thousand dollar fine or in the most extreme cases even life in prison so yeah it, it's it's obviously a trend that people are, are are waking up to at least which is good but uh but yeah hopefully we can turn it around before the uh the hammer comes down on on speech more broadly what's interesting about this is this this index really only highlights that there's a problem in journalism for the mainstream people. And again, it's because their, their, their grievance is with more totalitarian governments. Whereas independent journalism is kind of about its own problems, which sure are happening in those places, but are also happening via suppression in the West. So it's like we, we kind of have these two fights to have, you know what I mean? Where the mainstream, the, the interesting thing is they will, 
they will make progress in places like the Middle East and in places like China, or they will attempt to. I don't know if they'll actually make any. They'll at least highlight the problems. But in the West, I mean, they put Canada as 14th on the list. Canada actually improved this year, which is wild, because look at this legislation, whether it's C-11, C-18, or C-63. That is, a, that, is a, that is a free speech suppression weapon. How are you going to say that journalism is more free in Canada than it was before when most of the Canadians can't even see journalistic outlets on Instagram or Facebook or any of this stuff? And that's yeah. what I mean. So this thing, again, it's just like it feels like a bought and paid for report as well. The only thing that I use it for is to say like, yeah, not only is that happening, but here's what's happening in the independent world. And it is far worse. For sure. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's concerning. But you know, we're, we're seeing lots of uh, lots of discontent, which kind of leads us into our next story, which is that more Canadians are leaving the country due to poor affordability and lack of opportunity. So a recent study conducted by the McGill Institute shows that many Canadians are choosing to leave the country due to the high cost of living in Canada and the promise of a better job opportunities abroad. The study found that between 2017 and 2019, there was a 31% increase in onward migration meaning people leaving Canada after immigrating here. One of the main reasons cited for leaving the country within four to seven years of arrival is the difficulty in accessing economic opportunities. As for Canadians that have left, the majority of them are living in the United States, Hong Kong, and the United Kingdom. Statistics Canada estimates that around 4 million Canadian citizens were living abroad in 2016, compromising about 11% of the population. So what are the long-term implications of Canadians seeking to move out of the country while it would seem that more and more new immigrants don't want to stay? Well, it's going to be a major infrastructure problem, right? And I mean, look... Canada has become a global case study in the mismanagement of a first world country. That's what Trudeau has done, right? I mean, our economy has become exponentially worse since 2019. Uh, and that's when this report was done, 2017 to 2019. Um, our housing affordability crisis is, is legitimately world class. Our health care has more holes in it than a slice, <laughs> than a slice of Swiss cheese. Um, you know, very few Canadians feel optimistic about the opportunities in this country. Even those who do are sort of caught in the world's biggest taxation rat trap. You know, I'm of, I'm of the opinion that the country needs radical reform, but very few of us have the ambition to do it or the resources to do it. So um, until our leaders sort of take action to address these issues and at least try to turn this place around, more and more Canadians will be emigrating to other countries for a better life. But here's perhaps the bigger problem. This report um, was on new immigrants, right? But now it's not just new immigrants that are pissed off. It's all of the capable, high-earning Canadians. It's wealthy, it's the ambitious, it's the capable, it's the educated. It's, it's actually pretty wild. I would say that half the people I personally know, and I mean friends with, not just acquaintances, um, are either already planning to leave this country or it's in their near future plans, whether left or right. You know, and, and I think the issue you're going to have is Canada will become perpetually dependent on the government when this happens because all the high-value people will leave. And it will spiral out of control into a communist chaos. So, I mean, the, the long-term ramifications are pretty significant. And something to keep in mind when it just comes to society in general is society itself is a Ponzi scheme because when we, especially when we have these large social security nets that everybody talks so greatly about, right? Such Good as, point. So if you have less people on the bottom end of essentially in the their 20s to 50, like about 20 to 50, high high earners, putting really investing themselves back into the economy, earning, spending, so on, getting taxed for those social programs. Well, if you now have more people that are pulling money from the social programs than putting into it, well, those just all crash. So we're already now seeing, I think it was down in the States, there was talks about whether their social security and their uh, essentially pensions, uh, state-funded pensions would go bankrupt. Uh, it's very similar conversations happening in Canada as well, because yeah, how do you bankroll these things if business and uh, workers aren't, aren't coming here? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. If you look at the economics, or if you look at the math around Social Security, it is such a ruse. You basically lose 80% of your money. And that's even if you live to be like 85, 90. It's wild. You know, it's funny. My dad said to me that when I was a kid, I think I must have been, I don't even know if I was a teenager yet. He, he was like, Social Security is going to fall apart. There's going to be nothing left when you're older. You better be able to figure it out for yourself. And this was like this was like 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 25 years ago. So yeah, I mean, it's a it's very impending doom situation. But like I said, or like you said, rather, um, 
If you take out all the high earners and all the people that are actually ambitious and will make things better here, and all you do is create a society of people that don't give a shit and will live off the government, it will implode. It's going to be a total disaster. I, I just don't know, like, when you see these things happen, you kind of go, it's okay, someone else is going to come into political power and then they're going to change it. And, and, and for the most part, I agree, right? It's like two steps forward, one step back. That, that's kind of the idea sometimes, right? But the issue that I have, and I could be wrong here, the issue I have is that Trudeau has taken 15 steps in the wrong direction towards this sort of communist chaos, as I called it. I don't think that any government can take any more than five steps back. And I think that's if they've got two terms. So that still leaves you 10 steps in the wrong direction. Then you're going to have a liberal government again. If they're still pushing or peddling this same idea, if this is a long play, once they get back into power, it is over for this country. So, I mean, that's, that's why, like, you look at all these people leaving. This is going to get exponentially worse. I'm leaving this country. I don't know if it's going to be in 12 months, 18 months, or two years. I am definitely not staying here. There's no chance. Yeah, and we just saw it too, right? Canadian businesses, the insolvency rates is, is now at levels not seen since the Great Recession. Uh, so there was a 32% increase from the previous quarter and an 87% rise from the same quarter last year as far as business delinquencies go. And there was even that chart that the CEO of Spotify highlighted recently, which is extremely concerning that federal government, the jobs of the federal government is growing while the rates of small businesses is fa like fast declining. And so again, that goes to the idea of you're building a government which is growing larger and larger that requires removing funds and removing uh, resources from the economy in order to keep itself alive. And then you're having that economy that it is removing more and more from becoming smaller and smaller. Like that's just, it's just a recipe for disaster. Well, did you see what uh, Tiff Macklem said the other day? He's the governor of the Bank of Canada. No. So he came out and said, it's actually pretty controversial. All the MPs are not quoting him. He came out and said, he goes, Trudeau's government spending is the reason why inflation is continuing to stay high. Can just call them out. Makes sense. He's added over 100,000 people to the direct federal workforce. So th this adds up. That's a 40% increase. So obviously government spending is out of control. And when the rest of us are now suffering because of inflation, he just gave them all huge pay raises. What a dick. But he also said one other thing. He goes, the largest contributor to inflation is housing which is, again, being driven by immigration. These aren't my words. This is Tiff Macklin, governor of Bank of Canada. So you've got, like, the system itself is even turning on him because it's getting so out of hand that I think people from that generation are going, what the hell's happening to the country that I used to love, that I, that, that I grew up in, that I want to have my kids nurture and, and then raise their kids? They're going, if we don't fix this now, there's going to be nothing left for these generations, and they're all going to leave, which, like I said, is exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. And it's funny, you know what? Someone else the other day goes, well, do you really think that's the solution to leave and run away from it and blah, blah, blah? So I'm not running away from the problem. There's nothing here to do anymore. There's no opportunity. I'm an entrepreneur. I've spent the last 15 years hiring and employing people. I've had 500 employees. I've had several businesses. That's not an option here anymore. And even if I do hire people, I can't pay them enough to have a decent living. I'm in the restaurant business primarily. So when you look at that, you go, okay, yeah, you, you like, you know, you need a hundred thousand dollars a year just to get by anymore. Well, I can't, I can't provide that for people. Otherwise I'm going to have to charge $47 for a, I don't know, a glass of water. You know what I mean? It's just, just, just not feasible. That's what they've done to this country. I can't, I can't thrive here anymore and I can't do anything to fix it. Like I said, very few people have the ambition and the means. I have the ambition. I don't have the means. And we're up against this, this, this apparatus, this government apparatus that continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as to Pornell's ironclad law bureaucracy, it only exists to continue to exist. It will snuff me out so fast. I won't even make, I will make not even a dent. I wouldn't even be a drop in the ocean of what needs to happen to fix this fucking mess. So yeah, unfortunately I've kind of run the numbers on it. And the reality is I don't want to wait 10 to 15 years for this country to turn itself around. I'll be in my fifties. I'm good. I'm going to go raise a family somewhere else and do a lot better where the grass is greener. And look, I know there's no utopia, but it can definitely be better than this mess. Yeah. And actually, I had somebody recently reach out to me that I wouldn't have ever guessed would entertain the idea of living outside of Canada. And he called me and was just like, so like, hey, I've been listening to the podcast and I agree like things and things in Canada are definitely going down the wrong road. Like, I'd love to hear you guys talk about where where to go. And <clears throat> this is kind of my thing with it is. I don't want to put in anybody's head that there's, yeah, to your point, some utopia that they can go live in. The fact is, is that every single country in, on this planet has its issues. There's always going to be problems. You just get to choose your problems. And 
I don't want to live in a country where those problems are me getting thrown in jail potentially for saying something that the government doesn't for like. For saying something. or That's wild. It, and simultaneously having that same entity which is threatening my very freedom at all times just because of what I say or not even because of what I say because of what somebody else might think I might say in the future that's wild then and they're taxing me 50 percent as as the Fraser Institute has shown that the average Canadian roughly pays 50 percent in taxes across everything that's not just income tax but okay so you take half of my things and then you've constantly got a figurative gun to my head essentially like that's not the country I want to live in. I would actually go rather live somewhere that, because people will point, let's say you you toss out certain South American countries or whatever, people are like, well, their healthcare isn't as good. Or even actually, I, I looked into Costa Rica has the same healthcare score as Saskatchewan. But, and, and I mean, our healthcare is and just, trash And just now. for good measure, so everybody knows, the cost of living in Costa Rica is half of what it is in Canada. Almost exactly half. Yeah, and so... So there, there is problems like, yeah, okay, maybe even, even if that wasn't the case, yeah, maybe their healthcare wouldn't be the same. But like, again, I, I'm okay with having responsibility for myself and going, you know what? I trust myself to live a healthy lifestyle and God forbid I don't get hit by a truck or something. I don't see myself needing crazy uh, medical help anytime soon. And so it's like, you just get to choose your problems. And yeah, for me, Canada is those, those problems are too large. And I, I hate that idea that because I even told somebody close to me this as well that I was planning on leaving and they're like, well, I know things are getting bad, but like, I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think the answer is to run away from those problems. And I go, imagine it like it's a personal relationship just because the relationship started out well and you guys had a honeymoon period of a couple of months where everything was great, but then it devolved into constant, uh, constant arguing every you taking each other down a peg or cheating or or all of these vile things that can happen in relationships the you don't stay in that relationship merely because you've romanticized the fact that it was once good no i totally agree with you i mean to to, to that exact point i feel like canada is a country trudeau primarily that cheated on me like it was my wife and it cheated on me. And it's saying, oh no, Jonathan, everything's gonna be fine again. No, it's not. You suck that guy's dick. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna be okay. It's Trudeau never gonna might go have back actually to the same. Done that too. So, <laughs> so it's like I had almost everything taken away from me through the pandemic through being shut down in this business. You know what I mean? And they force you to take these loans to stay open in two weeks, two weeks, and it's not at all what happened. And then they've only made things worse from government spending. They are not here and they are not your friend. And that's exactly it. Look, you you can I can pick my poison, but based on what I like to do with my life and how I want to live it. This just does not offer the right opportunities anymore. And again, I know there's gun violence in America, and I know you got to pay for your health care depending on what happens. I know in Costa Rica, you know, like you said, it might not be as, like, I don't know, I don't, I'm going to learn to speak into the language. I don't see a downside there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, we look at the Cayman Islands again. Sure, it's expensive, but once you acclimate and you're there, it's not so bad. The tax system is literally zero tax. So based on a 50% tax rate, if I even just make half as much down there, I'm good. You know what I mean? So yeah, it, it, it's to, to, to your point, you just have to kind of decide what's important to you and what you want out of your life. And then you have to see if that government will basically allow you to flourish. And this government will no longer allow me to do that. And, and you know, you said something about the effective tax rate at about 50%. That's basically, look, this may be an unpopular opinion or someone's probably gonna call it wacko, but it's, it's basically like modern day nationalizing. You own 50% of everybody's everything. You basically own everybody. If I open a business, you get to take half of it? How is that? I'm basically nationalized. I know it's not, but it fucking feels the same. It's basically yours. I'm going to work half the time for you to take my shit. It doesn't make any sense, right? So, I don't know. Look, I hope things turn around and it's not goodbye forever. But, you know, I don't see this being my home for, you know, once we get out of here for at least a decade. Yeah. Yeah. And I've said before, when you put it into your, when you put it into your mind that a 50% tax rate means that you are effectively working for the government, you are paying the government six months out of the year of your efforts. 
Like you're essentially a slave. Slave. You're a slave. That's a hundred hundred percent, dude. Yeah. So it's pretty pretty gross. All right. And moving on here to our last story for the day, we've got the public inquiry on foreign interference finding that China was the problem. So according to a report from the Foreign Interference Commission, China's tactics are seen as the most persistent and sophisticated among the foreign interference threats faced by Canada. The Canadian Security Intelligence Service also flagged China as the biggest threat to Canada's electoral space. Despite the obstruction, the report claims that interference did not alter the outcomes of the 2019 and 2021 elections, but it might have influenced results in specific ridings and eroded public trust in the electoral process. The report, led by Commissioner Marie Hogue, suggests that undermining faith in democracy is a core objective of states engaging in foreign interference. So has the Chinese Communist Party been successful in its aims of eroding trusts in or eroding trust in our democratic institutions? Yes, absolutely they have, right? But it takes two to tango. You know, um, this is as much, if not more, on our government. That's how I feel about it, right? If they had made it public that this was happening and made every effort to combat it in the open, Canadians would probably have more trust in the institutions, right? Instead, Trudeau clearly benefited from this interference, and he went to great lengths to cover it up. It was actually pretty ridiculous. So you tell me how much trust you have in our democratic institutions, right? If anything, honestly, we should thank China. I know that sounds a little wild, but bear with me. Um... Because they were so aggressive with their interference, it actually shined a light on what our government was doing and is willing to do to win elections, whether that's working alongside foreign governments to sway elections or just moving mountains to cover it up. And we've now seen, you know, gladly this is maybe, again, silver lining here. Maybe it triggers some sort of action to these things where we uh, now we've got MPs from various political parties urging the Liberals to establish a foreign agent registry. And uh, the proposed registry aims to compel individuals involved in governmental or electoral influence on behalf of foreign powers to register their activities. Failure to comply would result in legal repercussions, including a imprisonment for foreign agents. Proponents argue that such measures are essential to safeguarding Canadian sovereignty and addressing concerns about foreign interference. And yeah, like if you're if you're able to undermine our if you're taking advantage of our legal systems and our democratic institutions in order to undermine those very things, like I don't see I don't see any issue with it because yeah, certain people uh so for instance a Senator Yuan Pao Wu opposed the idea yeah, the one Chinese guy. Of course he yeah. did. Well, I actually went and looked. He also, uh, in June of 2021, he opposed the Senate motion to recognize the ongoing persecution of Uyghurs in China. So he was saying that, so for anybody who doesn't know, there's roughly the estimates are over a million Uyghur Muslims are in concentration camps and forced labor camps in China right now. And so he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't acknowledge that said, said that it's, it's, it does us no good acknowledging that. And then he also, when it came to the Michael Spavor and Michael Korvig thing, which was two Canadians being held in China that uh, Han Dong, one of the people that was also really caught up in that whole foreign interference thing that he was he was found to be giving the Chinese intelligence uh, committees and uh, institutions advice on to not allow these two Canadians to go to use them as a political bargaining tool. But then also like this, this, this uh, Yuan Pao Wu, he was he was very much on that same side of trying to down play this whole idea that there was two Canadians essentially being held in China for no good legal reasons. Uh, they were just being used as political bargaining chips. And yeah, he was he was backing the CCP for that as well. So yeah, like, to be honest, it does like it gets into this sketchy realm where it's like, okay, are we going to head down a road of like, say, McCarthyism in the States where you got to tr- find out who is foreign actors in your government? and essentially going on a witch hunt which can become very dangerous very quickly but at this point i i see it as undeniable that those institutions have been compromised yeah you're in a tough spot here uh one other thing with that that gentleman Wu, um he was also given access to the he was given direct access to the um public inquiry on foreign interference mm. Uh, which is odd because I, I know that thing, the Uyghur Muslims, I think there were people that were part of that organization that were no longer willing to testify there because he was there. And they're basically saying, hey, this is going to get back to China and it's only going to make things worse for us. So it's kind of weird, right? You've got this guy that's openly opposing anything that's pro-Canada, but pro-China rather instead. 
and then he's given access to all these things when the Chinese were the ones interfering. You're kind of like, what's going on here? How hand in hand is the government with China right now? It's pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least or at least how well has China embedded their own people within our government? And it's not necessarily like the um, I guess it, it's two two roads to the same idea. Two I sides guess, of the same it's coin. Not, for yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah. It's like, is it official or is it unofficial? Yeah. But it's the same thing. Right. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, hey, there can be massive consequences to these things, not to say that it's on this level, but like, hey, the Soviet Union got their uh, got their atomic bombs by infiltrating the Manhattan Project in stealing uh, uh, American secrets. So it's like, hey, that's how we got to this world that we now have. And so, yeah, these this is definitely a real threat that I see to Canada. But it is funny that the Foreign Interference Committee was like, yeah, it had some uh, it had some outcomes. It might have changed some of the things in the writings, but it wasn't. It didn't have anything. It was insignificant. I'm you're like, like, what? Yeah, you guys, you can't say both of those yeah, things. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. My concern too was when you look at this foreign interference um, inquiry is that because it was done behind closed doors and because the liberals were the only ones there and then the opposing parties, uh, even the NDP or the conservatives, not only were not allowed in the room, but were not allowed to ask questions. So you're going, so you didn't even give me all the information. So the inquiry didn't even inquire. Yeah. Didn't even do it. It's like, it's right in the name, guys. Public inquiry. You kept it private and you didn't inquire. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> so it's, I don't know, man. It's all a bit of a ruse. For me, it's the same thing as I said earlier. I'll just say it louder. Government needs to fall. End of story. Yeah. All right. Well, anything else you want to add today? Yep, leave it on that note for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get out of here, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter, which goes out six days a week. That's blendernews.com. B-L-E-N-D-R news.com. And we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody.